Chapter 52, Mushrooms. Never would Daisy and Martha forget the taste of those barren town pies after the long years of cabbage soup at Ma Grunter's. Indeed, Martha burst into tears after the first bite and said she'd never known food could be like this. All of them forgot about the Ichabog while eating. Once they'd finished the pies, they felt braver and they got up to explore the Ichabog's cave by the light of the fire. Look, said Daisy, we found drawings on the wall. A hundred shaggy Ichabogs were being chased by stickmen with spears. <clears throat> See this wall, said Roderick, pointing out a drawing close to the mouth of the cave. By the light of the Ichabog fire, the foursome examined a picture of a lone Ichabog standing face to face with a stick figure wearing a plumed helmet and holding a sword. Looks like the king, whispered Daisy, pointing at the figure. You don't think he really saw the Ichabod that night, do you? The others couldn't answer, of course, but I can. I'll tell you the whole truth now, and I hope you won't be annoyed that I didn't before. Fred really did catch a glimpse of the Ichabod in the thick marsh mist that fatal night when Major Beamish was shot. I can also tell you that the following morning, the old shepherd who thought his dog had been eaten by the Ichabog heard a whining and scratching at the door and realized that faithful Patch had come home again because of course, Fiddleworth had set the dog free from the brambles in which he was trapped. Before you judge the old shepherd too harshly for not letting the king know that Patch hadn't been eaten by the Ichabog after all, you should remember that he was weary after his long journey to Chauville. In any case, the king wouldn't have cared. Once Fred had seen the monster through the mist, nothing and nobody would have persuaded him it wasn't real. I wonder, said Martha, why the Ichabog didn't eat the king. <clears throat> Maybe he really did cut it off, like the story say? Asked Roderick doubtfully. You know, it's strange said Daisy, turning to look at the Ichabog's cave. But there aren't any bones in here if the Ichabog eats people. <clears throat> it must eat the bones too, said Bert. His voice was shaky. Now Daisy remembered that. Of course, they must have been wrong in thinking that Major Beamish had died in an accident on the marsh. Clearly, the Ichabog had killed him, after all. She'd just reached for Bert's hand to show him she knew how horrible it was for him to be in the lair of his father's killer when they heard heavy footsteps outside again and knew the monster had returned. All four dashed back to the soft pile of sheep's wool and sat down in it as though they'd never moved. There was a loud rumble as the Ichabod rolled back the stone, letting in the wintry chill. It was still snowing hard outside, and the Ichabog had a lot of snow trapped in its hair. In one of its baskets, it had a large number of mushrooms and some firewood. In the other, it had some frozen chauvel pastry. While the humans watched, the Ichabog built up the fire again and placed the icy block of pastries on a flat stone beside it, where they slowly began to thaw. Then, while Daisy, Bert, Martha and Roderick watched the Ichabog began eating mushrooms. It had a curious way of doing so. It speared a few at a time on a single spike protruding from each claw, then picked them off delicately in its mouth, one by one, chewing them up with what looked like great enjoyment. After a while, it seemed to become aware that the four humans were watching it. Roar! it said again, and fell back to ignoring them, until it had eaten all the mushrooms, after which it carefully lifted the unfrozen Chauville pastries off the warm rock and offered them to the humans in its huge hairy paws. <clears throat> it's trying to fetzen us up, said Martha in a terrified whisper, but nevertheless he seized a folderol fancy, and the next 
second, her eyes were closed in ecstasy. After the Ichabog and the human had eaten, the Ichabog put its two baskets away tidily in the corner, cooked up the fire, and moved to the mouth of the cave, where the snow continued to fall and the sun was beginning to set. With a strange noise you'd recognize if you've ever heard a bagpipe inflate before somebody starts to play it, the Ichabog drew in breath and began to sing in a language none of the humans could understand. The song echoed forth over the marsh as darkness fell. The four humans listened and soon felt drowsy, and one by one they sank back into the nest of sheep wool and fell asleep. Chapter 53, The Mysterious Monster. It was several days before Daisy, Bert, Martha, and Roderick plucked up courage to do anything other than eat the frozen food that the Ichabod brought them from the wagon and watched the monster eat mushrooms it foraged for itself. Whenever the Ichabod went out, always rolling the enormous boulder into the mouth of the cave to stop it from escaping, they discussed its strange ways, but in low voices, in case it was lurking on the other side of the boulder, listening. One thing they argued about was whether the Ichabod was a boy or a girl. Daisy, Bert, and Roderick all thought it must be male because of the booming depth of its voice. But Martha, who looked after sheep before her family had starved to death, thought the Ichabod was a girl. This belly's growing, she told them. I think it's going to have babies. The other thing the children discussed, of course, was exactly when the Ichabod was likely to eat them, whether they were going to be able to fight it off when they tried. I think we've got a bit of time yet, said Bert, looking at Daisy and Martha, who were still very skinny from their time at the orphanage. You two wouldn't make much of a meal. If I got it round the back of the neck, said Roderick, miming the action. Bert hit it really hard in the stomach. We'll never be able to overpower the Ichabog said Daisy. It can move a boulder as big as itself. We're nowhere near strong enough. If only we had a weapon, said Bert, standing up and picking a stone across the cave. Don't you think it's odd, said Daisy, that all we've seen the Ichabod eat is mushrooms. Don't you feel as though it's pretending to be fiercer than it really is? It eats sheep, said Martha. Where did all this wool come from if it doesn't eat in sheep? Maybe it just saved wisps of wool caught on brambles, suggested Daisy, picking up a bit of the soft white fluff. I still don't understand why there aren't any bones in here if it's in the habit of eating creatures. <clears throat> what about that song it sings every night, said Bert. It gives me the creeps. If you ask me, that's a battle song. <clears throat> it scares me too, agreed Martha. I wonder what it means, said Daisy. A few minutes later, the giant boulder at the mouth of the cave shifted again, and the Ichabog reappeared with its two baskets, one full of mushrooms as usual, and the other packed with frozen Kurdsberg cheeses. Everyone ate without talking, as they always did, and after the Ichabod had tidied away its baskets and poked off the fire, it moved, as the sun was setting, to the mouth of the cave, ready to sing its strange song in the language the humans couldn't understand. Daisy stood up. What are you doing? whispered Bert, grabbing her ankle. Sit down! No, said Daisy, pulling herself free. I want to talk to it. So she walked boldly to the mouth of the cave and sat down beside the Ichabod. By Adares, age 12. <clears throat> Chapter 54, The Song of the Ichabod. The Ichabod had just drawn breath with its usual sound of an inflating bagpipe when Daisy said, What language do you sing in, Ichabod? The 
Ichabod looked down at her, startled to find Daisy so close. At first, Daisy thought it wasn't going to answer. At last, it said in its slow, deep voice, Ipperish. And what's the song about? It's the story of Ichabod, and of your kind, too. You mean people? asked Daisy. People, yes, said the Ichabod. The two stories are one story, because people were wounded out of the Ichabox. It grew in its breath to sing again, but Daisy asked, What does wounded mean? Is it the same as born? No, said the Ichabod, looking down at her. Bonded is very different from being born. Here's how new Wickabox come to be. Daisy wanted to be polite, seeing how enormous the Ichabod was, so she said cautiously, That does sound a bit like being born. Well, it isn't, said the Ichabod in its deep voice. Born and bonded are very different things. When babies are born dead, we have born dead and die. Always? Asked Daisy, noticing how the Ichabod absentmindedly rubbed its tummy as it spoke. Always, said the Ichabod. That is the way of the Ichabod, to live with your children. Is one of the strangeness of people. But that's so sad, said Daisy slowly. To die when your children are born? It isn't sad at all, said the Ichabod. The bonding is a glorious thing. Our whole lives lead up to the bonding. What we're doing and what we're feeling when our babies are bonded gives them their natures. It is very important to have a good bonding. I don't understand, said Daisy. If I die sad and hopeless, explained the Ichabod, my babies won't survive. I watched my fellow Ichabods die in despair, one by one, and their babies survived them only seconds. A Ichabod can't live without hope. I'm the last Ichabod left, and my bonding will be the most important bonding, bonding in history, because if my bonding goes well, a species will survive, and if not, Ichabods will be gone forever. All our troubles began from a bad bonding, you know. Is that what your song's about? Asked Daisy. Bad bonding? The Ichabod nodded, its eyes fixed on the darkening snowy marsh. Then it took yet another deep bagpipe breath and began to sing. And this time it sang in words that the human could understand. At the dawn of time, when only Ichabogs existed stony, man was not created with his cold, flint-hearted ways, then the world in its perfection was like heaven's bright reflection. No one hunted did us so harmed us in those lost beloved days. Oh, Ichabogs, come bonding back, come bonding back, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, come bonding back, come bonding back, my own. And tragedy once told me night, and bitterness bonded of fright. And bitterness so tall and stout was different from its fellows. The 
Its voices was rough, its ways were mean, the likes of it we had not been seen before, and so they drove it out with angry blows and bellows. Oh, Ichabogs, be born it wise, be born it wise, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, be born it wise, be born it wise, my own. A thousand miles from its old home, his morning time arrived alone. In darkness, bitterness expired, and hatred came to being. A hairless Ichabog, this last. A beast sworn to avenge the past. With bloodless was the creature fired, its evil life far seen. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did find, be born did find my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did find, be born did find my own. And hatred spawned the race of man, cause from ourselves that man began. From bitterness and hate they swelled, two armies rise to smite us. And hundreds of bogs were slain, our blood poured on the land like rain. Our ancestors like trees were felled, and still men came to fight us. Oh, Ichabogs, be born, did brave, be born, did brave, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, be born, did brave, be born, did brave, my own. Forced us from our sunlit home, away from grass to mud and stone, into the endless fog and rain. And here we stayed and dwindled, to love our race, there's only one survivor of the spear and gun, whose children must begin again with hate and fury kindled. Oh, Ichabogs, now kill the men, now kill the men, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, now kill the men, now kill the men, my own. Daisy and the Ichabog sat in silence for a while after the Ichabog had finished singing. The stars were coming out now. Daisy fixed her eyes on the moon as she said, how many people have you eaten, Ichabog? The Ichabog sighed. <sighs> None so far. Ichabogs like mushrooms. Are you planning on eating us when your morning time comes? She asked. So your babies are born believing Ichabogs eat people? You want to turn them into people killers, don't you? Take back your land. The Ichabog looked down at her. It didn't seem to want to answer, but at last it nodded its huge, shaggy head. Behind Daisy and the Ichabog, Bert, Martha, and Roderick exchanged terrified glances by the light of the dying fire. I know what it's like to lose the people you love the most, said Daisy quietly. My mother died, my father disappeared. For a long time after my father went away, I made myself believe that he was still alive because I had to, or I think I'd have died as well. Daisy got to her feet to look up into the Ichabog's sad eyes. I think people need hope nearly as much as Ichabog's do, but she said, placing her hand over her heart. My mother and father are both still in here. They always will be. So when you eat me, Ichabog, eat my heart last. I'd like to keep my parents alive as long as I can. She walked back into the cave and the four humans settled down on their piles of wool again beside the fire. A little later, Sleepy though she was, Daisy thought she heard the Ichabod sniff. <coughs> Chapter 55, Fiddleworth and the King. After the disaster of the runaway mail coach, Lord Spittleworth took steps to make sure such a thing would never happen again. A new proclamation was issued without the King's knowledge, which 
allow the chief advisor to open letters to check them for signs of treason. The proclamation notices helpfully listed all the things that were now considered treason in Cornucopia. It was still treason to say that the Ichabod wasn't real and that Fred wasn't a good king. It was treason to criticize Lord Spittleworth and Lord Flapoon, treason to say the Ichabod tax was too high, and for the first time, treason to say that Cornucopia wasn't as happy and well-fed as it had always been. Now that everybody was too frightened to tell the truth in their letters, mail, and even travel to the capital dwindled to almost nothing, which was exactly what Spittleworth had wanted, and he started on phase two of his plan. This was to send a lot of fan mail to Fred. As these letters couldn't all have the same handwriting, Spittleworth had to shut up a few soldiers in a room with a stack of paper and lots of quills and told them what to write. Praise the king, of course said Spittleworth, as he swept up and down in front of the men in his chief advisor's robes. Tell him he's the best ruler the country has ever had. Praise me, too, say that you don't know what would become of Cornucopia without Lord Spittleworth, and say you know the Ichabod would have killed many more people if not for the Ichabod Defense Brigade, and that Cornucopia's richer than ever. So Fred began to receive letters telling him how marvelous he was and that the country had never been happier and that the war against the Ichabod was going very well indeed. Well, it appears everything's going splendidly, beamed King Fred. By Emily, age 12. Waving one of those letters over lunch with two lords, he had been much more cheerful since the forgeries had started to arrive. But the bitter winter had frozen the ground so that it was dangerous to go hunting. Fred was wearing a gorgeous new costume of burnt orange silk with topaz buttons, particularly handsome today, which added to his cheerfulness. It was quite delightful watching the snow tumble down outside the window when he had a blazing fire and his table was piled high, as usual, with expensive pink stuffs. I had no idea so many Ichabogs had been killed, Spittleworth. In fact, come to think of it, I didn't even know there was more than one Ichabog. Uh, yes, sire, said Spittleworth, with a Curious glance at Platoon, who was stuffing himself with a particularly delicious cream cheese. Spittleworth had so much to do, he'd given Flapoon the job of checking all the forged letters before they were sent to the king. We didn't wish to alarm you, but we realized some time ago that the monster had, ah, uh, <coughs> coughed delicately, reproduced. I see, said Fred. Well, it's jolly good news you're finishing them off at such a rate. We should have one stuffed, you know, and hold an exhibition for the people. Uh, yes, sire. What an excellent idea, said Spitterworth through gritted teeth. One thing I don't understand, though, said Fred, frowning over the letter again. Did it? Professor Froddy Sham say that every time an Ichabod dies, two grow in its place? By killing them like this, aren't you in fact doubling their numbers? Uh, no, sire, not really, said Spitterworth, his cunning mind working furiously fast. We've actually found a way of stopping that happening by, uh, by... Banging them over the head first, suggested Flapoon. Banging them over the head first, repeated Spittleworth, nodding. That's it. If you can get near enough to knock them out before killing them, sire, the, uh, the doubling process seems to, uh, seems to stop. But why did you tell me of this amazing discovery, Spittleworth? cried Fred. This changes everything. 
we might soon have wiped Ichabog's from Cornucopia forever. Yes, sire, it is good news, isn't it? said Spittleworth, wishing he could smack the smile off Lacoon's face. However, there are still quite a few Ichabogs left. All the same, the inn seems to be in sight at last, said Fred joyfully, setting the letter aside and picking up his knife and fork again. How very sad that poor Major Roach was killed by an Ichabog just before we began to turn the tables on the monsters. Very sad, sire, yes, agreed Spittleworth, who of course had explained away Major Roach's sudden appearance by telling the king he'd laid down his life in the marshland, trying to prevent the Ichabod coming south. Well, this all makes sense of something I've been wondering about, said Fred. The servants are constantly singing the national anthem. Have you heard them? Jolly uplifting and all that, but it does become a bit samey. But this is why we're celebrating our triumph over the Ichabogs, aren't they? That must be it, sire, said Spittleworth. In fact, the singing was coming from the prisoners in the dungeon, not the servants, but Fred was unaware that he had 50 or so people trapped in the dungeons beneath him. We should hold a ball in celebration, said Fred. We haven't had a ball in a very long time. It seems an age since I danced with Lady Islanda. <clears throat> Nuns don't dance, said Spittleworth crossly. He stood up abruptly. A boon, a word. The two lords were halfway toward the door when the king commanded. Wait! Both turned. King Fred looked suddenly displeased. Neither of you asked permission to leave the king's table. The two lords exchanged glances, then Spittleworth bowed and Flapoon copied him. I crave your majesty's pardon, said Spittleworth. It's simply that if we are to act on your excellent suggestion of having a dead Ichabog stuffed, sire, we must act quickly. It might a rot otherwise. All the same, said Fred, fingering the golden medal he wore around his neck, which was embossed with the picture of the king fighting a dragonish monster. I remain the king, Spittleworth, your king. Of course, sire, said Spittleworth, bowing low again. I live only to serve you. Hmm, said Fred. We'll see that you remember it, and be quick about stuffing that Ichabog. I wish to display it to the people. Then we shall discuss the celebration ball. Chapter 56, The Dungeon Plot. As soon as Spittleworth and Flapoon were out of earshot, the King Spittleworth rounded on Flapoon. You were supposed to chuck all those letters before giving them to the King. Where am I supposed to find a dead Ichabog to stuff? So something, suggested Flipping with a shrug. So something? So something. Well, what else can you do? Said Flapoon, taking a large bite of the deep delight he'd sneaked from the king's table. What can I do? Repeated Spittleworth, incensed. You think this is all my problem? You were the one who invented the Ichabog, said Flapoon, quickly as he chewed. He was getting very bored of Spittleworth shouting at him and bossing him about. And you're the one who killed Beamish, snarled Spittleworth. Where would you be now if I hadn't blamed the monster? Without waiting for Flapoon's response, Spittleworth turned and headed down to the dungeon. At the very least, he could stop the prisoners singing the national anthem so loudly, so the king might think the war against the Ichabogs had taken a turn for the worse again. Quiet! Quiet! bellowed Spittleworth as he entered the dungeon, because the place was ringing with noise. 
there was singing and laughter, and Cankerby, the footman, was running between the cells, fetching and carrying kitchen equipment for all the different prisoners, and the smell of maiden dream, fresh from Mrs. Beamish's oven, filled the warm air. The prisoners all looked far better fed than the last time Spittleworth had been down here. Didn't like this. Didn't like it at all especially didn't like to see Captain Goodfellow looking as fit and strong as ever he had. Fiddleworth liked his enemies weak and hopeless. Even Mr. Dovetail looked as though he'd trimmed his long white beard. You are keeping track, aren't you? He asked the panting at Kinkerby. Of all these pots and knives and what knots you're handing out? Of course. Of course, my lord, gasped the footman, not liking to admit that he was so confused by all the orders Mrs. Beamish was giving him that he had no idea which prisoner had what. Spoons, whisks, ladles, saucepans, and baking trays had to be passed between the bars to keep up with the demand for Mrs. Beamish's pastry, and once or twice Cankerby had accidentally passed one of Mr. Dovetail's chisels to another prisoner. He collected everything in at the end of each night, but how on earth was he to be sure? And sometimes, Tinkerby worried that the warder of the dungeon, who was fond of wine, might not hear the prisoners whispering to one another if they took it into their heads to plot anything after the candles were snuffed out at night. However, Tinkerby could tell that Spittleworth was in no mood to have problems brought to him, so the footman held his tongue. There will be no more singing, shouted Spittleworth, his voice echoing through the dungeon. The king has a headache. In fact, it was Spittleworth whose head was beginning to throb. He forgot the prisoners as soon as he turned his back on them and fell back to pondering how on earth he was going to make a convincing stuff to take a Perhaps Flapoon was on to something. Might he take the skeleton of a bull and kidnap a seamstress to stitch a dragonish covering over the bone and pat it out with sawdust? Lies upon lies upon lies. Once you started lying, you had to continue, and then it was like being captain of a leaky ship, always plugging holes in the side to stop yourself sinking. Lost in thought of skeletons and sawdust, Spittleworth had no idea that he'd just turned his back on what promised to be his biggest problem yet, a dungeon full of plotting prisoners, each of whom had knives and chisels hidden beneath their blankets and behind loose bricks in their walls. <clears throat> Chapter 57, Daisy's Plan. Up in the marshlands, where the snow still lay thick upon the ground, the Ichabod was no longer pushing the boulder in front of the cave mouth when it went out with its baskets. Instead, Daisy, Bert, Martha, and Roderick were helping it collect the little marsh mushrooms it liked to eat, and during these outings they also prized more frozen food from the abandoned wagon, which they took back to the cave for themselves. All four humans were growing stronger and healthier by the day. The Ichabod, too, was growing fatter and fatter, but this was because its bonding time was drawing ever closer. As the bonding was when the Ichabod said it intended on eating the four humans, Bert, Martha, and Roderick weren't very happy about the Ichabod's growing belly. Bert, in particular, was certain the Ichabod meant to kill them, now believe he'd been wrong about his father having an accident. The Ichabod was real, so clearly the Ichabod had killed Major Beamish. Often, on their mushrooming trips, the Ichabod and Daisy would draw a little ahead of the others, having their own private conversation. What do you think we're talking about? Martha whispered to the two boys as they searched the bog for the small white mushrooms the Ichabod particularly liked.
by Madeline, age 12. I think she's trying to make friends with it, said Bert. Whoa, they'll eat us instead of her, said Roderick. That's a horrible thing to say, said Martha sharply. As they looked after everyone in the orphanage, sometimes they took punishments for other people too. Roderick was taken aback. He'd been taught by his father to expect the worst of everybody he met, and that one way to get on in life was to be the biggest the strongest and the meanest in every group. It was hard to lose the habit he'd been taught, but with his father dead and his mother and brothers doubtless in prison, Roderick didn't want these three new friends to dislike him. Sorry, he muttered, and Martha smiled at him. Now, as it happened, Bert was quite right. Daisy was making friends with the Ichabod, her plan wasn't only to save herself or even her three friends. It was to save the whole of Cornucopia. As she and the monster walked through the bog on this particular morning, drawing ahead of the others, she noticed that a few snowdrops had managed to force their way up through a patch of melting ice. Spring was coming, which meant soldiers would soon be returning to the edge of the marsh. With a funny seasick feeling in her stomach because she knew how important it was that she got this right, Daisy said. Ichabog, you know the song you sing every night? The Ichabog, who was lifting a log to see whether there were any mushrooms hiding beneath it, said. If I didn't know it, I couldn't sing it, could I? It gave a wheezy little chuckle. <laughs> Well, you know how you sing that you want your children to be kind and wise and brave? Yes, agreed the Ichabod, and it picked up a small silvery gray mushroom and showed it to Daisy. That's a good one. You don't get many silver ones on the marsh. Lovely, said Daisy, as the Ichabod popped the mushroom into its basket. And then... In the last chorus of your song, you say you hope that your babies will kill people, said Daisy. Yes, said Ichabod again, reaching up to pull a small bit of yellowish fungus off a dead tree and showing it to Daisy. This is poisonous. Never eat this kind. I won't, said Daisy, and drawing a deep breath, she said, but do you really think a kind, wise, brave Ichabod would eat people? The Ichabod stopped in the act of bending to pick up another silvery mushroom and peered down at Daisy. I don't want to eat you, it said, but I have to, or my children will die. You said you need hope, said Daisy. What if, when the burning time comes, they saw their mother? Or their father. I'm sorry, I don't quite know. I will be their Icar, said the Ichabod, and they'll be my Ichaboggles. Well then, wouldn't it be wonderful if your your Ichaboggles saw their Icar surrounded by people who loved it and wanted to be happy and to live with them as friends? Wouldn't that them with more hope than anything else could do? The Ichabod sat down on a fallen tree trunk, and for a long time it said nothing at all. Bert, Martha, and Roderick stood watching from a distance. They could tell something very important was happening between Daisy and the Ichabod, and although they were extremely curious, they didn't dare approach. At last, the Ichabod said, perhaps, perhaps it would be better if I didn't eat you, Daisy. This was the first time the Ichabod had called her by her name. Daisy reached out and placed her hand in the Ichabod's paw, and for a moment the two smiled at each other. Then the Ichabod said, when my bonding time comes, 
you and your friends must surround me, and my Ichaboggles will be bonded knowing you're their friends too. And after that, you must stay with my Ichaboggles here on the marsh forever. Well, the problem with that is, said Daisy cautiously, still holding the Ichabog's paw, that the food on the wagon will run out soon. I don't think there are enough mushrooms here to support the four of us and your Ichaboggles too. Daisy found it strange to be talking like this about a time when the Ichabog wouldn't be alive. But the Ichabog didn't seem to mind. Then what can we do? It asked her, its big eyes anxious. Ichabog? said Daisy cautiously. People are dying all over Cornucopia. They're starving to death and even being murdered, all because some evil men made everyone believe you wanted to kill people. But I did want to kill people until I met you four, said the Ichabod. But now you've changed, said Daisy. She got to her feet and faced the Ichabod holding both of its paws. Now you understand that people, most people anyway, aren't cruel or wicked. They're mostly sad and tired, Ichabog. And if they knew you, how kind you are, how gentle, how all you eat is mushrooms, they'd understand how stupid it is to fear you. I'm sure they'd want you to and your Ichaboggles to leave the marsh and go back to the meadows where your ancestors live, where there are bigger, better mushrooms, and for your Ichaboggles to live with us as our friends. You want me to leave the marsh? Said the Ichabog, to go among men with their guns and their spears. Ichabog, please listen, begged Daisy. If your Ichaboggles are bonded surrounded by hundreds of people, all wanting to love and protect them, wouldn't that feed them more hope than any Ichaboggle ever had in history? Whereas if the four of us stay here in the marsh and starve to death, what hope will remain for your Ichaboggles? The monster stared at Daisy and Bert and Martha and Roderick. <clears throat> and Bert and Martha and Roderick watched wondering what on earth would happen. At last, a huge tear welled in the Ichabog's eye, like a glass apple. I'm afraid to go among the men. I'm afraid they'll kill me and my Ichaboggles. They won't, said Daisy letting go of the Ichabog paws and placing her hand instead on either side of the Ichabog's huge, hairy face, though her fingers were buried in his long, marsh weedy hair. I swear to you, Ichabog, we'll protect you. Your bonding will be the most important in history. We're going to bring Ichabog back and cornucopia too.